Good morning, and welcome to this week's program of Study the Word. Once again, this is brought to you by the River Ridge Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh, Indiana. We'd love to have you come and worship with us, folks. Presently, we're meeting at the Newburgh Elementary School, right in the heart of Newburgh. Please come and be with us. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for a Bible study, 10 o'clock for worship. We meet in the afternoons at 4 once again, and then we have a midweek Bible study every Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We have classes for all the age groups. Bring your whole family. We'd love to have you. All right, we're going to go ahead and jump right into this week's question, and we want to encourage you to stay tuned because at the end of the program, we offer some free Bible study helps that a number of our viewers have been requesting. And so if that's of interest to you, we hope you'll stay tuned because we offer a free home Bible course. Our question today, and I have received this many times over the years, people have asked me, are you the only ones going to heaven? And what do you mean by that? And of course, often what that relates to is the Church of Christ. Should I, you know, are, are only those who go to the Church of Christ going to heaven today? And I guess really, folks, this is probably one of the most misunderstood lessons that you could ever come up with because this is what's causing the religious confusion of our day. To our non-religious friends who look at the religious realm, they, just, they, they see the confusion. They see the division. Now, it's easy for people to get on TV and tell the non-religious world hey, we're just all a bunch of religious groups trying to get to heaven. We're just going different roads, taking different roads, excuse me. And, the, and they look at, look at that and, and see the inconsistencies that are there. And they're absolutely right. I'm on their side. I'm on the side of people who see the confusion and say, if that's what religion is all about, I don't want any part of it. And if that is what it's all about, I don't want any part of it either. See, if there's one thing I learned from the Word of God, and that is that God wants unity on His terms. We find that over in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. I want you to listen to what Paul told a local church. He said, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So, people say, well, Chuck, what you just read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10 was written to a local body, a local church. And so as long as that local church has the same mind and there's no division among them, then that's okay. He's not talking about having uh, the same mind and be totally united with all the churches in the world. It's not what he's talking about there. And so you can have those different religious groups that are out there as long as those different religious groups are united and are of the same mind, that's all that really matters. Well, no, that's, that's not true. Now, now, I do agree that he's talking about on a, on a local congregation level here. But it seems to me that what they're implying is is that one religious group can differ from another religious group and they both be right. Now, so what I'm saying is, how is that possible? For a logical thinking person who understands that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, I am going to build my church. His. Okay? So we, we get that. No problem. We understand that. Of course, all the religious groups today, for the most part, will say, well, Christ is the head of our church. Is that so? He built your church? Yeah. We just don't call it Christ Church, but we call it by different denominational names. But it doesn't really matter. And I'm, that's what I'm challenging today. Does it really matter? See, in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given unto me. How much? All authority. And so when you read in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 that Jesus is the head of the church and he has the preeminence, that means it belongs to him. Of course it belongs to him. Acts 20 and verse 28, he purchased it with his own blood. The church that he said he was going to build. 
Now we need to pursue this idea that it really doesn't matter what religious groups believe as long as they're united in what they believe. They might not be united with all the different religious groups. It doesn't really matter. And we're saying, well, no, because if they're all claiming, now here's the key, if they're all claiming that Jesus is the head of their church and he has all the authority, 2 John 9 says you have to abide in the doctrine of Christ. All right, so let's, let's take the denominational concept for a moment. And they say, well, here's one denomination. They say Christ is the head. He has all the authority. And we're abiding in his doctrine. Okay. Here's another denomination. He says Christ is our head. All right. And uh, we're, we let him rule. He has all the authority. And we're abiding in his teachings. So we can go on and on with many more because obviously there are hundreds and thousands of different denominations in the world today. But if they're all going to say that, then to the non-religious people, they're saying, well, then if that's true, then you must all agree. And But they know we don't. We know, they know we don't agree. And so they're saying that that just doesn't even make any sense. And they're absolutely right. Again, I'm on the side of the people that see the confusion, see the inconsistencies, see that it doesn't make any sense and don't want anything to do with it. Now, I tell them, well, wait a second, that's not what it's all about. That's not what the church is about that you read in the New Testament. That's not the church of our Lord. He didn't create denominations. He didn't. Those are man-made. You see, the idea that we can have all these differences is because they think that we can't be united. I'm not saying we will be united, but I'm saying we could be. There's a difference. I know we, we, we won't be united because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, that the majority of this world will be lost. They're going to go down the broad road that leads to destruction. Only a few that are going to make it. It's always been the faithful few. But to even imply that you can have these different understandings, these different beliefs, and we're all right, you're conceding the point that we can't understand the scriptures alike. And that's just not true. We can. We can have the unity that Jesus prayed about. Now, I don't have time this morning to read the whole chapter of John 17. But folks, if you get a chance, you read this. Because here is a prayer that Jesus is offering to the Father. And he talks about the fact that he wants the unity, us to be united the way Him and the Father are united. Well, how is that going to be possible? Was that possible by Jesus doing things differently than what the Father wanted? No. He said He came to do the will of His Father. And what about you and what about me? Are we doing everything by the Lord's approval? That's Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ or by His authority. Now somebody says, okay Chuck, the River Ridge Church of Christ, when did you start? Said, well, we started assembling together as a church five years ago. Well, so then you created a, nom a denomination. No, no, we didn't create a denomination. What do you mean by that? Well, let me, let me point something out to you. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, okay, Jesus has already ascended back into heaven. The apostles are preaching and teaching, okay? And then the last verse, when those people obeyed the gospel, it says in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Church. What church? What church were they being added to? Well, it would be the church that Jesus Christ established, his spiritual body. There was no building there. It's a spiritual body. That's what the word church means. And so these people who are conforming themselves to the teachings of our Lord, who become a Christian, the Lord adds them to his church. And so even today, when somebody hears the gospel, I don't care where you live in this world, if you hear it and you obey it, the Lord adds you to his church. So if you have a person here in Newburgh where the Lord has added them to the church, that universal body of Christ. He said there's only one in Ephesians chapter 4. And you have another person in Newburgh who obeys the gospel and the Lord adds them to the church. What happens when they come together? Well, 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17, Christians come together as a church, as a local church. Local church. People are not added to a denomination. They're added to the church of our Lord. And the, these local body of Christians who have come together as a church, who's the head of it? Jesus. What do they teach? Whatever Jesus said to teach. They're to abide in his doctrine. So they don't come up with their own doctrines. And so five years ago when we came together, we had a bunch of Christians starting to assemble in this area. And it's the, they, they are a local church, a local church of Christ. Remember Romans 16, 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Paul said, I'm sending greetings on behalf of the churches that I visited. And you can read in Acts where Paul went on three missionary journeys. And he, for, when he went to one city, people obeyed the gospel. Bang! A local church was started. He went on to another city. People responded to the teaching. They became Christians. They started to assemble. Another church was established. So you had churches in Ephesus, in Philippi, um, uh, Galatia, um, Thessalonica. The list goes on and on. Paul traveled around and churches were being established when people obeyed the gospel. Now, when Paul um, left one city and went to another, remember, people obeyed the gospel and they became Christians and they started to assemble. So when he went to another place and they became Christians and they started to assemble, was that a denomination? Was that a different denomination? Was he establishing different denominations as he traveled around? No. Why? Because there's only one church, the church that's Christ. Yes, local churches, more than one, but one universal body of Christ. And so what about us today, five years ago? Did we start the church? No, we didn't start the church. Christ built his church over 2,000 years ago. He purchased it with his own blood. We can't reinvent the wheel, folks. We can't start it. Now, if we wanted to become a denomination, that's relatively easy. We come up with a denominational name, something you don't read about in the Bible. But sometimes people come up with a with a, uh, a biblical name, but they start teaching some things that are not found within the Word of God. That's how you become a denomination. Or sometimes people become a faithful congregation, just like you read over here in, in Revelation chapter 2, and churches fall away. They fall into apostasy. So a faithful church can eventually leave the Word and start doing what they want to do, and they can become a denomination. How does that happen? Well, Paul told Timothy, this is exactly how it happens. 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says in verse 3, the time will come when they, he's talking about Christians here, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And so you're going to find that people want to mix truth and error together, and they're comfortable with that. They'll take away some things, they'll add some things, and what you have is you have a religious group. Our Lord wants us to abide in His teachings. And so you need to belong to the church that Jesus said He was going to build. Now, in order to belong to that, you have to, number one, become a Christian. That's what happened in Acts chapter 2. Let me just quickly go there because it hasn't changed. How people became Christians in the first century is how people become Christians today. And the first thing you need to do is hear the Word of God and hopefully you'll believe it. Sometimes you can hear the Word of God and, and it won't even faze you because we don't care. We don't believe it. But here, when they heard the Word of God, it says in verse 37 of Acts 2, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's what we hope, that people will hear the gospel and they'll inquire, what do they need to do? Well, Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. For what? For the remission of your sins. That's the key. You need your sins gone. All right? Well, we find down in verse 41 that those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day about 3,000 souls were added. So they obeyed the gospel. And what happened? Verse 47 we read earlier and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So, the Church of Christ that meets in Newburgh. 
Are, are, are we the only church in the world? <laughs> no, of course not. It doesn't matter where you are on the face of this earth. If you have some people who have obeyed the gospel and they come together, the Lord has added them to the church and they create a local congregation. Please remember the verse I mentioned earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17. Folks, listen. Request this free DVD. You can go over the verses slowly at home on your own. If you have a DVD player, just request this program. You need to learn about the church you read about in the New Testament. You don't need to belong to a man-made organization. What's a man-made organization? It's a denomination. I don't belong to a denomination. Well, Chuck, you started your own church there five years ago. No, I didn't. I did if it wasn't the church that Jesus built. Well, how do I know if it's the church Jesus built? You're going to have to go to the Word of God and make sure that we have Jesus being the head with all the authority and we abide in His doctrine. Now, when we come together, we are to worship God in spirit and in truth. John 4 and verse 24. We don't make up our ways of worship. We've already discussed that in previous programs. We've, we talked about Cain. We talked about Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10. They were offered strange fire and the Lord consumed them. They didn't worship God the way God ordained. And for you and I to say that, well, I'll, I'm just going to do this for the Lord. It won't matter. It does matter to God. And so I know there's a lot of nice people in this world who are doing things sincerely, but they're sincerely wrong. That is nothing new. How do I know that? You just have to turn over to Romans chapter 10. You know, Paul talked about those people. He says here in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. But here's the problem, verse 2. I bear them witness that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They have zeal. And there's a lot of zeal in this world. Folks, I see religious groups doing all kinds of things. Now, they don't have any authority in here for it, but they're doing a lot of things. They have zeal, but not according to knowledge. And we need to make sure that if we're going to be a part of the, the, uh, the body that Jesus is the head of, we better remember that it belongs to Him. And so... Are we saying that you have to go to the, uh, River, River, the River Ridge Church of Christ in, in order to be considered faithful to God? Of course not. You need to belong to the Church of Christ, all right, locally in a certain area that's abiding in His teachings. Now, if you remember and if you listened carefully, a few moments ago I said sometimes people have a scriptural name and they're still a denomination because they do things that a board of directors invented or they have in their creed books. See, here's our creed. Here it is, the Bible. The New Testament. We're under the new law, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what you find is that people are following their catechisms today, their church manuals, you know, doctrines that have been created from, from man. Uh, they got together and they voted on certain things. Uh, you can read about that even in church history. They, they came together. There's that the Council of the, the, of the Nicene, the Nicene Creed. Uh, there are people that have come together and, and said, here's what our religious body is going to believe. Well, are, are we saying that we can't read and understand this on our own? You know, I studied with a, a gentleman one time, and uh, he belonged to a, a certain religious order that had a society that told him what, their, what they were to believe and what they were not to believe. And we were studying the Bible. He agreed to study the Bible. And he could see what the Bible was teaching, but yet he opened up their manuals that taught the exact opposite of what the Bible taught. And I asked him then, I still remember his first name. His name was Les. And I said, Les, what's it going to be? Church manual or the Word of God? And he said, church manual. I said, well, there's nothing I can do to help you then. You have decided to become a follower of man. And Paul warned against that. The only reason you have success within the denominational realm is because people are giving people what they want to hear. It's called supply and demand. People say, why are there so many different religious groups, Chuck? Why are there so many uh, different restaurants? It, it's to meet the demands of the people. And so people are trying to say, look, I'll give you what you want. Now, what happens if you come to the River Ridge Church of Christ where I and others attend? It's not my church, it's the, it's the Lord's. 
what, what will you get? You'll get the whole counsel of God. We will not hold back in anything. We will not um, be man-pleasers. Paul mentioned that in Galatians chapter 1. He simply said in verse 10, For do I now persuade men or God? Do I seek to please men? If I still pleased men, I would not be a servant of Christ. In this same book, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul said, Have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Folks, truth. You have to have a love for it. Now, sometimes truth hurts. But if that's what you're seeking, you'll admit when you're wrong and you'll move on. None of us are perfect, including myself. I used to belong to the denomination until somebody challenged me on my beliefs. I believed what I was following was based upon the Word of God. And I found out that a majority of what I was believing and following came from the mind of man. And so I'm trying to encourage you folks to make sure that your lives are in harmony with this and you belong to that blood-bought church. See, well, it doesn't matter what church you go to. Folks, to even concede the idea that we can be believe different things and still go to heaven is to somehow concede to the thought that we can't understand the Bible alike. Are we going to call Jesus a liar? You know, Jesus is the one who said in John 8 and verse 32, you can know the truth and the truth will set you free. You can know it. You know, Paul wrote the Ephesian brethren. He said, by reading, you may understand what the Word of God is, what, the, what His will is. By reading, you can understand. Nothing has changed. You can go back to the beginning of time. Eve quoted to the serpent exactly what was right and what was wrong. No, nope, can't eat of that. I can eat of any other fruit, but I can't eat of that tree. Or I'll die. Oh, he says you won't. She understood what the will of God is. Most of us today, most even religious people, most religious people understand what the Bible says. They don't question what it says. They question the why. They question the why. And so when you see people coming together and doing certain things uh, that are not found within the Word of God, and I've studied with them, they'll say, well, Chuck, what you're doing isn't wrong because you have biblical support. But they'll say, but I don't think what we're doing is wrong. But it's based on a feeling or emotion. It's not based upon a thus saith the Lord. And so this is why we tell people when you come and visit us, you need to do exactly what the Lord commanded in 1 John chapter 4, and verse 1. What was that? It said, test the spirits to see whether they are of God or not. Test them. You know, over there in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 15, when, when we were told, beware of false prophets, how do you know who a false prophet is? How in the world would you know whether a church is faithful to God or not? How would you know that? The only way you can know is by going into the Word and studying and comparing it. Once you learn this, then you'll know if somebody's telling you a lie, if somebody's drifted away from the pattern you find within the Word of God. And God expects us to, to abide. Remember Jesus said, if the blind lead the blind, both fall in the ditch. You, folks, get this. You need to understand this. If you belong to some denomination and you stand before the Lord and say, Lord, well, they taught me the wrong thing. Bottom line is, you believe the wrong thing. Telling a lie and believing a lie are both just as wrong. So we can't pass the buck, blame it on somebody else. You know, you have Adam blaming Eve, Eve blaming the serpent, all the way down the line. And for you and I, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10. Every one of us. You're going to be judged on an individual basis, not as a church, not as a group, but on an individual basis. Why did you believe what they were teaching? Well, I thought it was the thing to do. There were so many people there. How could we possibly be wrong? If I was wrong, then millions of others would have been wrong, Lord. And that's what the Lord is saying. Well, yeah, millions of others are wrong. It's always been the faithful few. And you need to decide, are you going to be a follower of man or are you going to be a follower of the Lord? Now, to be a follower of the Lord, it's going to take effort. In Matthew chapter 7 and in verse 7, he simply said, if you seek, you'll find. But it's going to take effort, folks. You're going to have to open up your Bible. You're going to have, you're going to, have to ask questions. I've had people call up and say, Chuck, can I talk to you about this? Uh, a gentleman last week said, send me the DVD on this one. I, I want to go back over it. I want to learn. I want to make sure because 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 says to examine ourselves whether they're in the faith. You have to do that, folks. And so, whether you go to the River Ridge Church of Christ or somewhere else, wherever you attend, it is your responsibility to make sure that what you're doing 
is approved by God. Now, the biggest danger, and our time is quickly getting away, uh, I want to just share with you quickly a passage over in the book of John, chapter 12 and verse 42. He says, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. If you start asking questions where you go, people are going to consider you a troublemaker. Why are you asking these questions? We've always taught this. Why, why, why are you making a fuss now? You might say, well, I was watching this TV program called Study the Word, and it just got me to thinking that I need to make sure that what I'm believing is found within the Word of God. It isn't so much, folks, that you believe something. It's why you believe it is the key. There are many people that are believers and are lost because they're believing the wrong thing and practicing the wrong thing. All right, so that's what we talked about today. The subject of the church I love to talk about. I love to come into your home, sit around the table. You can say, Chuck, here's where I go. Here's what we do. What does the Bible have to say? We'll just open up our Bibles. We'll sit around the kitchen table. Let's study together. I mean, you just call up, we'll set up a time that's convenient, and we'll sit around and we'll study the Bible together, and you can just ask your questions and see what the Bible has to say. Don't ask me what I think. It doesn't matter what Chuck thinks. It matters what the Word of God has to say. How about a free home Bible study course? That seems to be popular with our viewers. It's only six lessons. We'll mail it out to you. You work at it at your own speed. After you answer the questions, you put it in the return envelope that we send you, along with a stamp. See? It doesn't cost anything shouldn't cost you to learn the Word of God. You mail it in, I'll check it over. And then I'll send it back to you so, so you can hold on to it for future reference along with your next lesson. And one of the things that we often encourage those people to do who take the course is submit names of friends or relatives that, they, that you think that might also enjoy it. And what, has, what that does is it just gets more and more people studying at home Getting their Bibles open, which is the purpose. That's what we're doing today, folks. It's called study the Word, and you're watching it in the comfort of your own home, trying to get you to think about spiritual things. But not thinking about spiritual things, but, but knowing them by getting into the Word of God. Remember, you can know the truth. And the truth will set you free. It'll set you free from being a blind follower. We have too many people that are saying amen and yes to things that people say that are false. And we need to be aware of false teachers, which Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. Would you like to receive our free weekly bulletin? It's like a short sermon on paper. Um, submit your name and address, and we'll put you on the mailing list. And you'll get a couple of bulletins every two weeks, and uh, just some additional teaching, all backed up with what the Bible has to say. And if you'd like that, by all means, um, let it be known. Check out our website, riverridgechurch.org. Uh, you, you can also find our location where we're at, a map, but some other free Bible study help, some, some sermons you can listen to live on there, um, and just a way to contact us if you have any Bible questions that you would like dealt with on this program. Folks, we hope you'll be back next week. Remember this afternoon at 2 o'clock, turn on your radio, 98.5, for our radio program. Have a great week, folks. We'll see you next week. Thank you.